welcome to our second installment of our Cooking Crave Show. I am Rhonda Fitter and we are again in the kitchen of my mother Laverne Didi. And today we're going to make a unique dish that many of you may not have had before. We're going to make Kraut Burgers. And here is my mother Laverne to kind of tell us what is involved in making Kraut Burgers. Well, good morning and I welcome you to the show also. I hope you enjoy it and hopefully I can teach you a new dish. Okay, so Kraut Burgers. When you think of Kraut, I, I, honestly, I, I, I automatically think of sauerkraut. Is that what's in this dish, Laverne? Well, no, it's actually going to be cabbage that's going to be put into the hamburger. Um, we're going to start with, uh, I'm going to start with about three pounds of hamburger. Okay. And we want to ground the hamburger first. Okay. So we're going to just kind of chop that up and brown it. Now three pounds of hamburger, this is going to make quite a bit of a mixture of meat, isn't it? You'll probably get about three dozen uh, crop burgers out of it. Okay. And what's nice if you make a little bit bigger batch, they freeze really well. And you can have them, and they're even good cold, so if you wanted to have some for lunch or just heat it up in the microwave, it works really well. Okay. So we just want to chop up the hamburger to get it into small pieces. And do you find um, like an extra lean hamburger is going to be your best option? Or what do you, you generally use when making this dish? I really like to use the lean hamburger. Okay. Um, if you have less than the 93%, you're going to have to drain the grease off. Okay. So it's good to start with at least 93% or any ground chucks or whatever that okay. you find on sale. You know, and I've used, found that, you know, a potato masher will help make the hamburger quite fine so that, you know, it, uh, in small pieces and browns easily. I have never seen this before. I don't think I've ever seen you use a potato masher in hamburger. How long have you been using this? Well, it, it's something I fair, learned fairly recently myself. Okay. And uh, it, uh, like I said, it works well. It chops up the hamburger nicely. And, you know, this one here is just a heavier plastic one that is nice when I'm using a Teflon pan because you don't want to use a metal pan because you don't want to scratch your Teflon. But it just yeah, I up. see that it really picks up and, and and makes the meat into smaller pieces, so you don't have to keep chopping. Right, makes it a lot finer. Probably browns a little faster too. Okay. That way. And that. So while this is starting to brown, I'm going to put some seasoning in it, and it's pretty much a matter of taste. With this amount of hamburger, I'll probably use about two teaspoons full of uh, salt. Go. And, and just regular salt is, is all you use here, not, okay, any seasoned salt? Uh, no, this, that's all you need is regular salt. And pepper to taste, you know, most, we like quite a bit of pepper. So I'm going to put two teaspoons in here, but um, most people may want to just start out with a, a teaspoon of pepper and just kind of taste it and see how they like it. And you can always add, you can't take it out. So. Right, so as, as you're gr making the hamburger mixture, if you put salt and pepper in and once it's browned and you taste it and it's not to your liking, you can add more is what That's you're saying. correct, okay. yeah, you bet. I guess like you can always add, but you can't take it out, so. Okay. And as this is um, browning here, we're going to be grating some cabbage. Okay, and how much cabbage do you use in a three pound mixture? About, I had a medium to a large head of cabbage. Okay, so yeah. one medium to large head. Yes, Okay. and I had just cut it up into uh, smaller chunks because I'm going to use my food processor here. It really grates the cabbage very finely, so when I mix it into the hamburger it's going to be you know, it mixes well and there's not going to be big chunks. Okay. And I use about a, oh, about a large onion for this size and I also cut that up because I'll put that in here and break the onion right away too with the cabbage so then you have it all mixed okay. up. So. so we're just 
There, I actually have uh, grated some of the cabbage already, so I won't be this here. I'll just wait till the hamburger does brown a little bit more, so we'll put that in there. All right. And the reason you put the ha cabbage in with the hamburger is that it uh, steams it up and it kind of condenses it, and you know it isn't. Uh, you know, it doesn't look like a lot of cabbage because once it's steamed into the hamburger that it really isn't that much. Okay. As you can see, it's just about brown here. But I do want the hamburger completely cooked before I put the cabbage in. Okay. That potato masher really does work really right. well for this. And you can use that anytime you're making like chili or tacos or anything. You got it in the pan. Just uh, use the potato masher and uh, Mix it nice and fine. Potato masher, not just for potatoes anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I see that's almost getting done with being brown, so we'll be able to add the cabbage soon. Right. Yeah. Now, is this a dish that you make often? Through the winter months and stuff, that I, I do. I will make this fairly often. My family really likes it, but when I do make it, I usually make it quite a big batch. Okay. I'll usually do eight to ten pounds of hamburger and a couple of heads of cabbage, and because then I divvy it out to the kids. And because and then, like you did say earlier, they do freeze really well all right. as well. Now, do you freeze them in uh, like a Tupperware type container or in? freezer bags, what do you find the easiest to freeze these? I think if whatever you're going to have on hand in your kitchen, um, if you have Tupperware, if you have uh, the freezer bags are good because it condenses a little bit more. If you don't have a lot of freezer room, okay, uh, it's easier to put a freezer bag in there than a bigger Tupperware container. So okay. it's to whatever you may have, it's going to, just as long as it's you know, in something that's sealed. Okay, so you can see that that's pretty much cooked here. And when I'm saying cook in the hamburger, I don't really brown it as, you know, make it fry in it. I just make sure that it, it's just cooked thoroughly. It doesn't have to be browned. Okay, so, so. just as long as there's no pink showing. Correct. Okay. So we're going to add the cabbage in. Now this is a cabbage and onion mixture because you, you mixed a little bit of both in here when right. you were grating. Okay. Yes. Oh, that does look like a lot. It, it does. It looks like a lot of cabbage, you know, but once it's uh, mixed in, in with the hamburger and steamed up, you won't find that it, it's a lot. Okay. Not too much, so. And you're now I see that you're using just a regular food processor. You know, it says right on there, food processor. Is this I something... My greater thing here. <laughs> oh, need to put the blade in first. Yes, I do. Is this something that you could chop by hand? But you're probably just not going to get as, as fine of pieces. That, or it's even going to—it's going to take longer. You know, okay. You, you have those hand graters that you can grate, and that, okay, and, you know those work well. And I used that for many years before I had gotten a food processor. So okay, I'm going to just stuff that cabbage right down in there, and, and it does go very quickly. Right, then you know, put the onion in there. Kind of simultaneously, then it kind of uh, blends it up more, and the onion goes right in there. Now, food processors, I would assume that you would be able to pick something like this up if you wanted to, to use something like this at a department store, local Walmart or Kmart, I would think would carry something like this as well. That's right. I think uh, just about any place has food processors. Okay. And there's some really fancy ones out there that can do a lot of things besides just chopping, you know, or grating your food. Now, do you find other uses for this yourself in your everyday cooking? I do really like to use this food chopper at Christmas time, you know, I'm going to chop a bag of walnuts. Oh. Instead of, you know, chopping the walnuts with a little small food chopper or even rolling it out with a rolling pin. Oh, there's a, another blade that goes in the bottom of this, and I put the bag of walnuts in there, and I got the walnuts chopped really fine, so then I don't have to 
I've got a whole bag chopped already for whatever recipes I'm going to use it for. Okay, and I suppose that just takes probably under a minute. Yes, it doesn't take very long at all. And I usually use the pulsating uh, button versus the one that stays on because stays on, when you put this one on, it keeps going. And I like the pulsating one because then when I lift my finger up, but it just... It's done. Okay. I have uh, emptied the last of the cabbage in here, and I'm just going to mix this all up with the hamburger. And it looks like a lot of cabbage, but once it's steamed in with the hamburger, it's going to not be that much at all. And, you know, you can make this to your taste, too. If you like the, the cabbage, that's fine. If you want to maybe use a little less cabbage, it, it's just whatever you know you would like to do. Oops, my cord come out of here. Now, is this a recipe that um, has been in your family for a while, or where did you come up with this recipe? Well, this recipe uh, was something that I come across a uh, gal that I worked with after Ron and I were first married. So I've had it on about 40 years already. But it wasn't something that we had at home uh, when I grew up. It was something I learned. Well, it's still pretty old. It's about 40 years that I've been working with this. Okay. And it's just gone over really well. And, uh, you know, people just really like it. And through the years, I've had to t make lunches. My husband, uh, you know, for work. And I would put a crop burger in for lunch versus, you know, trying to make a sandwich because it is good cold also. It, you know, it's good warm, that's for sure, but even um, just having it cold, it, they're good. Because everything's thoroughly cooked and baked right. right away, so it's not something that you have to worry about for um, health reasons. You can't have it cold or hot, like you that's said. That's right. It's already cooked and, uh, you know... And you have it in your lunch bucket, and uh, usually those are insulated, and so it keeps well. Okay. As you can see, the hamburger's kind of getting mixed. That's getting mixed up here. And just a little bit about your fry pan. This is about an average size fry pan. Um, if you if you are going to make double batches, do you? Make one batch, set it aside, or how how do you, you usually do that? When I make a bigger batch, I brown the hamburger, or cook the hamburger in this pan, but then I transfer the hamburger into uh, my eight quart um, scale, uh, cooking kettle and put the hamburger in there, and then this way I can just add the cabbage in there. Okay, and, and then you could do that on the stovetop then? Then I do it on the stovetop. So you could do it a couple different ways? That's, yeah, just whatever is convenient in your kitchen. So. And, and, and maybe there are, are some viewers that prefer working on the stove top versus working in a fry pan like this. And it would work equally as well. If you just have a regular skillet and you don't have an electric frying pan, that will work also. So okay. I'm going to just put the lid on there to let it steam for a short time. And then we're going to be getting our dough ready to, you know, roll out and start making the crop burgers. Okay. Now, before we start uh, rolling out our dough, what I want is I'm going to put this... Uh, mixture hamburger and cabbage in my colander because I want it drained well. Uh, you want the juices out, cabbage creates a lot of juice and uh, when you're rolling out the, your dough you don't want all that liquid. Oh because yeah, you know, I would think that would get soggy and it would... Well it'll seep out of your dough and uh, you know kind of burn so I'm going to just measure all, put this in here and as you could even see when I'm picking it up it, it looks like it's pretty juicy. So I just put a bowl under my colander so that it doesn't run all over, of course. Now, while you were making this, if, if somebody wanted to do substitutions um, based on texture, you know, maybe they don't want as big of pieces like of the cabbage and, and onion mixture, do you have suggestions for that? Now with this here being, we steamed it, the cabbage really with the food processor, it is pretty small. Uh, some people don't like the texture of onion. Um, putting it through the food processor does chop it up quite fine, 
and with it steamed in here, you don't even know that there's onion pieces in there. But people that are probably a little bit more sensitive to the idea of onion, you could just puree it. You could actually put it in your blender and uh, puree the onion, and this way you'd get the same flavor. Um, and I think it's more of a more flavorful than using onion powder. Okay. That that'll work well too. So. Okay, so just puree it like you said, or or just chop it quite a bit finer, and it, you you feel that that probably would still be best. Correct. Yes. Okay. I think that works very well. So there we got that in there. It didn't look like that was all going to fit in that colander, and it did. Yes. Well, I started this morning and I made my own dough. Um, does take a little bit of time, so if you don't have time and don't want to make your own dough, the frozen bread dough works great. You just take out your frozen bread dough, leave it rise. You want to let it completely rise because you're not going to be able to roll that frozen dough out uh, if it's, you know, not risen completely. Okay. So you let that rise. Another uh, good thing to do is you can even buy the individual frozen bundle and of course you're gonna want to let that rise also and roll it out and now you have little individual little pieces your smaller uh, roll dough you might need two you might need to roll the bottom one out put the hamburger filling on and put the top piece on and and pinch it together there they have the bigger uh, hamburger bundle that you can have and that would be enough to fill it and, and pinch it together with just one. Okay, well we'll, we'll get started here and we'll let the, the, our viewers know what recipe you do use for your bread. Um, you've been using this bread recipe for quite a while, I take it? Well, I did write down the ingredients in this. I've been making bread dough for many, many years. I start, started at home, uh, come from a family of ten and we didn't use recipes. We just put the ingredients in and and you just worked with it until you had the right texture. So, okay. Okay. You know what also might be if you if you like the idea of a fresh dough that is 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 made like this. A lot of bread machines come with uh, you know a recipe book that have a dough recipe in there as well and the bread machine would actually make your dough for you. So if you don't want to go the frozen route which I find I would probably do myself just for ease and you know that's a no-brainer you know just to let it rise and start there but if, if you don't have your own recipe and you're not comfortable with that, you can certainly use a bread machine maker and make your own dough that way. Yes, uh, a lot of bread machines do have just uh, the setting to make bread dough before it goes into the baking process. And you may not, you're not going to get as big a recipe, but it'll work fine. And you may not want to make as big a batch as what I'm making here today. Right. So, so I floured my counter because I'm going to cut the dough. I always just kind of grease my fingers a little bit so the dough doesn't stick. And then I take that and I just pick it up and take a chunk off and cut it off there. And Now I do see that you used a, a butter Crisco to, to grease your hands. Is that what you generally use or it is margarine or what, what would work best there? Anything that can grease your hands will work fine. Your Crisco, your uh, oil and uh, anything like that. So now I'm going to roll out the dough and we want the dough about um, probably it's going to be maybe an eighth inch thick is what we want. Okay. Now you're using a pretty unconventional rolling pin. It doesn't have handles. Is there a story behind this? <laughs> uh, yes there is. This rolling pin is quite old. Older than I am which that makes it pretty old. Uh, the I, this is what I used, learned to use at home when growing up on the farm and making the bread dough and it didn't have handles. I don't know whatever happened to the handles. In fact, when I started learning to uh, bake bread or, or roll, never even knew that handles roll. existed. That's right. <laughs> and so through all the years and I acquired that when I got married and uh, to use a conventional rolling pin. I find it very difficult rolling with the handles. But we do have one conventional rolling pin here. Just to show people what a normal rolling pin looks like. And 
I think I would find that this would be easier because I don't know that I would have the, I don't know, the ability to keep moving. <laughs> to <roll. laughs> and, you know, I find without the rolling pin, I mean, without the handles, I'm actually able to put more pressure on the dough. So we've got the dough about the thickness that we want. So we're going to now cut them in squares. I might make this a little bit thinner here. About four inch squares. Now I, I'm doing this on my counter, so I'm going to do it very lightly uh, so I don't cut my counter top. But there. About like that. That's what I just. And they're obviously not all the same size as you are doing this cutting, so you're going to have different size product at the end is yeah. and how it works. They taste all the same, no matter what shape or form it is in. Yeah, right. And that. So now we're going to take our uh, cookie sheet, and we do want to spray it lightly. I'm going to get two of them ready right away because we're going to need them. Okay. And this is a dark cooking sheet. Does it matter what cut type of cooking sheet you do use? I have some of each. I only have one of this. I do really like the dark uh, cooking sheet, but the other ones that I have, they all work well. Okay. So you're not. And for, for some people that might have an air bake cooking sheet, is that something you recommend for the crowd burger? I have a couple of air bake cooking sheets, but I usually don't use it when I'm making the crowd burgers because I like the bottom a little more browner than what I get the results out of an air bake cooking sheet. Okay, so a regular cooking sheet you do find the best. I like it the best. So, so we're just going to set that hamburger there and we just take a spoonful and we just put it in our dough. And I'm, there's quite a bit of filling in each one. I, I do you like a, a good meaty crop burger, a lot of filling in it. And I just bring the edges up and pinch it like this. There's no trick to pinching it or how you need to. And uh, Just as long as it's pinched well so nothing would come right. out in the baking process. That's right. And then I like to uh, put the pinched edge down on the cookie sheet and then that won't open up. Okay. So, so that's the process of that. And with my own cooking dough, or excuse me, my own bread dough, it's more pliable and I find it, it works a little bit easier than, you know, the frozen product, but, you know, that still works. So, you can see how I'm doing there. Now, your, the bread dough recipe that, that you do have here, is it something that you're able to use in a variety of different things other than just crowd burgers? What else would you use this bread dough for? You, when I start with my bread dough, I just, like I said, I don't measure, I put in, and I don't really necessarily measure my filling. And I make my crowd burgers first, uh, fill all that, use up all the filling, and I'll usually probably have a little bit of bread dough left, and then I'll make a pan of caramel rolls with that same dough. Okay. It works very well. So it's, well. it's, it's not a, a dough that's just specifically for kraut burgers. You could use it for rolls or other type of baking as well. Right. It's okay. It's just a basic, uh, you know, for bread, buns, rolls, anything that you don't you'd like. Okay. And what I did start out this morning with my bread dough, I used about 10 to 12 cups flour. I did measure that this time. And I used two eggs and uh, about a teaspoon of salt. And uh, I use a little bit of cooking oil in my bread dough too. But I put that in, I, I always make my bread dough with milk. And I'll use just um, instant milk and... Oh, so not milk out of the fridge. like. Or is that, is that something you could do? You, you absolutely could, but doing the powdered milk, it's a little bit more economical. Okay. And that, in this way, if uh, I'm using, because I used about four cups of, of milk, and then that way I don't run ourselves short of milk in case I'm not getting to the grocery store, you know, real soon. And, that, and you want uh, your uh, milk warm, uh, so the, I use warm water 
uh, to put the instant milk in so my uh, milk is already warm. And in that then I'll add about uh, a half a cup of uh, oil, just cooking oil, you know, like your Crisco, Wesson cooking oil. Okay. And a vegetable it, oil or is canola oil or whatever you have just available? Any kind of vegetable oil or canola is fine. Okay. Like I said, it just makes the dough a little softer and pliable and I, and I actually feel like it makes it a little bit moister. So you feel a little bit easier to work with. Right. So there's some definite benefits behind making your own bread dough, but it's not something that's a requirement. Oh, absolutely not. And that it just there. So uh, and then you, I used uh, two tablespoons of yeast and you want to dissolve that in lukewarm water, about a cup of lukewarm water and I always add about a tablespoon of sugar to, the, to that mixture too because it actually makes the yeast rise a little bit faster. So when it's rising in, the, in your bowl and you want to let the yeast rise and when that's risen then you can add all that into your, into your flour. Okay. So, and then you just mix that uh, till it's you feel the right consistency, and then you take it out of your bowl, and uh, you're going to uh, you want to knead your dough quite a while. I usually knead my dough for about 15-20 minutes. The longer you knead your bread dough, the the better it is. Okay. And that so. Okay. Now we have finished uh, filling two pans, so we're going to just go pop them in the oven. The oven has been preheated. Uh, to 350 and I do use two racks and I will put the timer to about 15 minutes because then I'm going to rotate it. Now are you re using regular bake or is it something if you have a convection bake oven is that something that you do recommend? I, I have a convection bake and I really really like it but I don't use the convection bake when I'm making uh, with dough. It seems like um, it doesn't bake quite as nicely as I would like to see it. It bakes it too quickly. Okay. Or whatever. So that's where I will just rotate it so that it will brown uh, the top and the bottom evenly. So, but the convection bake is a wonderful oven for your, uh, you know, doing cookies or just a lot of other things. And I, I wouldn't want to be without it. It, it works nice. Okay. So now you do have the first two pans in the oven. We should probably be able to fill up another two pans here, it looks like. That should be about it, right. We'll okay. have about uh, approximately four dozen with, with this uh, recipe here. And uh, the dough, as you can see, it is in different sizes. And what makes it, you know, it's all right not to have it uniform because you'll have different sizes and maybe you have a youngster that uh, you know isn't going to eat a, a bigger one. This way you have the smaller or you've had one and you know you really shouldn't have that second one but if you have it a little smaller you won't feel so guilty. But being these are baked this is not something that you have to worry about you know I, when I look at this you know Another German dish that you can make with dough and hamburger, more of the patties, is the, is the flesh kegel and that's deep fried where this is baked. It's, it's not going to be as high in calories or cholesterol because we're doing it the way we are. That's right, yes. And uh, I think your dough product when it's baked will taste better when it's reheated or um, eaten it cold because now you actually have a bread like a bun versus you know having uh, fried bread okay. okay okay this is starting to smell really good mom all right it looks like they're done we've baked them for 30 minutes we're going to just take them out there they're nice golden brown and they're nice and brown on the bottom what we want so we're going to go ahead and pop the other two pans in And again, you, once you set the timer for 15 minutes and then you just rotate it so they cook evenly, correct? That's correct. That's what I did. Yes. Now we're going to put them on a cooling rack. We're going to just uh, see that finished product there. 
Okay, so I wish the viewers can have the senses of the smell because they just smell wonderful. You know, they're nice and steamy. You got your nice hamburger crop filling in there. Uh, most of my family just likes them without uh, just plain, but many people like to eat them with ketchup, and you can just put a little ketchup on the plate there. And so it's kind of like almost one. like a hamburger in a sense that if, if you do like ketchup, um, this is something right. you would definitely want to eat with ketchup because yeah. you, you could just it dunk it and, and yep, there, there we are. So there's the finished product. I hope you have a chance to make these and enjoy them as much as my family does. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Cooking Crave. Again, today we made crow burgers and I hope you do get the opportunity to make these yourselves as I'm sure you will enjoy them. If you have a recipe that you would like to submit, please go to www.ctctel.com and please submit your recipe as we would love to make those as well. You will also be able to find this recipe, Crow Burgers, on that website. Again, that's www.ctctel.com. And I'd like to thank my mother again, Laverne, for hosting the show with me today and making this awesome dish. Thank you so much and have a great day.